So I just want to welcome everybody today. My name is Jim. I'm the lead pastor here. Happy Easter to all of you. All right. Now, when I was a kid growing up in a very traditional church, we had this thing that we would do where the pastor would say a phrase and then the church would repeat it. Anybody ever do that when they were? All right. And so the pastor would say, he is risen. And then the church would respond. Let's do it again. He is risen. Man, you guys have been around some time. Young people are like, what? What's that all about? All right. Well, today we are talking about the empty tomb. And the whole thing about the empty tomb is that Jesus is alive. Now, as I was thinking about it this week, I was thinking about typically when we think of the word empty, the word empty kind of has kind of a negative connotation to it, right? I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Like, so when I was a kid, you know, we would have cookies, but we didn't have them in the packages we had a thing called a cookie jar, and it was ceramic, and sometimes it was a teddy bear or something, some of their little bit, or you know what I'm talking about, right? And so it was always sad when you'd go into the kitchen, and you'd take the lid off the cookie jar, and it was empty, because who ate them? How many say dad? How many say mom? How many say it was a sibling? <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> sibling, right? But it was, it was always a sad day when it was empty, right? Because when something is empty, it is, it is a sad thing, right? Another thing is when unexpected things happen in life and you go to look in your checking account because there's all these unexpected bills and your checking account is almost empty, right? It, it's like, ugh, right? So when we think of empty, it's kind of a, a frustrating thing. How about another one? So your car's getting worked on, so you go out and get in your spouse's car. Man, you guys live in the same house I live in, right? And the gas tank is on empty, right? And you're happy and polite and nice to your spouse over that, right? And, you know, and then because it's empty, anyway, so it's a, it's a negative thing. So I remember years ago, when it comes to an empty gas tank, I'm going to tell stories on my dad today because he's probably watching online and over Cincinnati. And when we were kids, whether it was my brother and I, my mom and dad, we had this new van, this big Dodge van, and it was an upgrade from our old 63 wagon that we had, Chevy Bel Air wagon, where my brother and I had to share the back seat, no seat belts, no car seats. We didn't stop to go to the bathroom. We had a can. And anyway, everybody grew up in that house. That was the house I grew up in, right? So it was the same way when we got older and we got this van. Now my brother and I both had a bench to ourselves. It was nice and comfy and cushy. And we went out west. We went all the way out to California. And we're working our way down the coast from the north down. And we're on Route 1 coming down. And, you know, we're... My dad comes up, we're, you know, the gas tank's getting close to empty, but gas prices were ridiculous. So my dad's like, I'm going to keep driving, right? Right? We'll find something cheaper. We'll keep driving. How many live with that person? I just keep driving. Right on past. So next thing you know, that little light comes on. Now, back in the day, cars didn't like tell you DTE, right? You know what I'm talking about? They didn't have a little thing that told you, you know, how many miles you had before you were completely empty, right? So that light comes on. You're like praying. I mean, that's where we all came to faith that week, right? We're just like praying. It's like, oh God, please get us. My dad was like, oh, please, please help me get a gas station. Two boys in the back seat, you know, in the back benches. We're driving down and then we finally roll into this town. And there's this gas station. It was like, duh. Like, you know, and, and you pull, he pulled in, he pulls up to the pump. A guy comes walking out. Sorry, sir. We're closed. My dad I never saw him plead so hard. It's like, come on, please, please. We're on vacation. It's like, we're just, I just need gas. It's on empty. I got two kids in the back. Look, look, don't look how kids look sad. You know, it's like, don't they look just pitiful? It's like, come on, just give me some gas. Like, I'm sorry, the cash register already closed. Isn't it crazy how we let systems rule us? Right? It's like the, the cash register already, already closed. I can't, I can't pump any more gas for the day. And my dad's like, come on, just just even a couple of gallons. And so the guy says, okay, hold on one second. He walks in the garage, back then gas stations had garages, over there, comes out with a five-gallon gas can with gas in it. 20 bucks, you can have this five-gallon can, can of gas. <laughs> now, 20 bucks back then was a lot. Gas was only like a dollar something, 
right? Remember those days? That was a long time ago, right? It was like a dollar something, 20 bucks for five gallons. My dad, like, are you kidding me? Right? And it was like, 20 bucks, take it or leave it. So it's too cheap to stop at that gas station back there to fill up. So now we got to pay $20, but it was like, we're taking it so we could get the rest of the way. So when something is empty, most of the time, it is something that is just frustrating and disappointing. But when it comes to the tomb of Jesus Christ, it is the most exciting thing that we have in this life. Because of the empty tomb, Jesus is alive. And we have an enemy that wants to steal us. He wants us to go through life being empty. And when there's one thing that's empty, when our lives are empty, that's when life gets really hard, right? But Jesus says this in John 10, verse 10, this first verse here in our notes, said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. The enemy wants us to go through life on empty. But Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus came. He rose from the grave so that we could have a life to the full, filled with all that he has for us. That is what makes Easter so significant, is that Jesus is alive. And so we're going to look at three simple things today. I'm going to try to make this quick today because it's Easter. How many of you got food cooking right now back home? Right? I'm going to be in trouble if I don't make this short. Right? So we're going to look at three simple things today. The significance of the empty tomb, of this thing being empty. The first thing, number one, is this. Is that the empty tomb gives us the hope of eternal life because death was defeated. We have a hope because death was defeated. We have the hope that this, this life is not the end. When we breathe our last breath, it is not the end. We have the hope of eternity and the hope of eternal life. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I often think about death, it just still seems like a really hard thing to think about, right? But Jesus came. He's like, look, I've overcome the grave so you can live with the hope that the grave is not the end. There is a future in eternity with our Savior. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul wrote these words to the church in Corinth, one of the churches in, in the first century church. He wrote these words. He says, if our hope in Christ is for this life only, right? So he's saying that if this is the only hope we have is just for the now, he says, then we should be pitied more than anyone else in the world, if we're just getting excited about the empty tomb for just the now, right? It's just we have hope for just now. Then he says, we should be pitied more than anyone else in the world. Verse 20, but Christ has truly been raised from the dead. The first one and proof that those who sleep in death will also be raised. This is where our hope is. Verse 21, death has come because of what one man did. Is referring to Adam. But the rising from death also comes because of one man. Verse 22, in Adam, all of us will die. In the same way, in Christ, all of us will be made alive again. That is our hope. And then he goes on a few verses later, and he, and he kind of makes this statement. He says, death is destroyed forever in victory. That is the hope that we have. And then he, he makes this comment, verse 55, death. He says, where is your victory? Death, where is your pain? There is no more sting or pain of death because Jesus defeated it when he overcame the grave. He died for our sins on the cross. We just celebrated that on Good Friday. Our sin debt was paid for in full. He became the sacrifice for our sins. But then he overcame the grave. So not only do we have power over sin, but now we have the hope. We have power over death. And Christ will give us a new life in him that this life is not the end. And we can live with that hope. The second thing, number two, when it comes to the significance of the empty tomb, is the empty tomb opens the resurrection power of Jesus Christ in our lives. So sin, we talked about this last week, we looked at the last words of Jesus, when he said, it is finished, 
The word tetelestai, our debt is paid in full. Jesus accomplished everything that needed to be accomplished on the cross in defeating the power of sin over us. But because of the empty tomb, we now have access to the resurrection power of Jesus Christ in our lives. That we can live every day in that power. Now, how many of you ever bragged about something? in your life. We all kind of do it sometimes, right? You're working on a project and you're just amazed that you actually figured it out, right? And your spouse was amazed that you actually figured it out, right? How did you do that? Just like, wow. You know, we like to tap ourselves on the shoulder sometimes, right? And, And there's just times when we can go around bragging. Well, there were some people in the early church that were bragging, and they were mostly these, these Jew, Jewish believers that were bragging, and they were focusing on the law, and that they had done everything in keeping the law. And so the Apostle Paul writes this letter to the church in Philippi, and he's addressing this issue, that it's easy to get caught up in, in the things that we think we have done, that we have accomplished. And, and in this part of this letter, Paul's going through saying, look, I've done so many things. I worked my way all the way to the top to be a part of the the Jewish leadership, the Sanhedrin. He said, I've done it all. I've been there, done it all. Worked my way, worked hard. But this is what he said in Philippians 3, verse 7. This is the very credentials these people are waving around as something special. Look what I did. Look what I did. Look what I've accomplished. He said, I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash, along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? He says, because of Christ. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Verse 10, I gave up all that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally. That's the whole significance of the empty tomb, that we could know Christ personally, and not only that, but to experience his resurrection power and to be a partner in his suffering. And he said, so I can go all the way, all the way to the end of my life, go all the way with him to death itself, if there was any way to get in. in where does it say? Go all the way with him to death itself. So, so the whole significance of this is Paul saying, look, I, I want to experience this personal relationship with Christ, and I also want to experience the power of the resurrected Christ in me. That's the significance of the empty tomb. We have access to the resurrection power of Christ in our lives. Matter of fact, there's another letter, one of my favorite letters that Paul wrote to a church, the church in Ephesus. And if you ever read the book of Ephesians, it, it is such an incredible, encouraging letter. And Paul, throughout this whole letter, he is pleading with this church. He's like, guys, I want you to understand who you have in Christ. I want you to understand who you are in Christ, all that Christ has done for us, that your eyes would be open, that your hearts would be revealed, and that you would be able to experience all that God has for you and all that he has done for you. And so in Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 18, the Paul, Paul saying, I'm praying for you. And he says, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light, so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. Verse 19, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. You see the significance of what Paul is saying? He said, guys, because Jesus rose from the grave, his resurrected power is available for us. As we looked at last week, we have power over sin because of his sacrifice, but we have power to live every day in the fullness of what Christ wants us to live in because the same power that raised Christ from the grave is alive in us when we believe in him. That is the hope of Easter. That is the significance of the empty tomb. This thing is empty And because of that, we have the hope of eternal life. We have access to the resurrection power of Christ. And the third thing I want us to just grasp in this when it comes to the significance of the empty tomb 
is that the door of the empty tomb is an invitation to the new life in Christ. That is the significance of the stone being rolled away. It is an open door. It is the the door to just an open invitation to this new life that we can have in Christ. Now, we've all walked through open doors, right? I mean, when you get in your car, you have to open the door so you can get in. When you go home, you push a button. Typically, you got to open the garage door, hopefully, you know, to get in, right? Or go to the front door. We're all used to walking through open doors or opening doors so that we can walk through. Years ago, when, when I was a kid, my brother and I, we lived in, we had a converted attic, was the upstairs of our house. Anybody have a converted attic growing up? Lived in, and, and there were these, these you know, the, the eaves of the house, the walls kind of separated them, and there were these things on the side called cubby holes. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? Anybody else have cubby holes? And, and there were these doors that were always closed, and we were told not to go in there. Never tell boys not to go in a door, a cubby hole, right? So most of the time, we never went in there because there was just a bunch of junk in there. And then something significant happened in 1975. A team won the World Series. Anybody remember who won the World Series in 1975? Cincinnati Reds. I lived in Cincinnati. I grew up in Cincinnati, right? Now, the only reason I remember this is because we didn't have a TV that worked. This nice big console TV we had in our living room was just a decoration. My dad still has it. It's in his basement. The tube went out right after I was born. And my dad said, those boys, they just sat there and watched and watched. It's like, we're not, we're getting, we're not going to get it fixed. But then when the Reds won the World Series, he was like, man, I wish I had that TV fixed. So my dad comes upstairs one day, and he opens that door to that cubby, and he disappears. It's like, where'd he go? Right? My brother and I was just like, and you could just hear this sliding. And we could hear it going all the way down to the end of the room. It's like, what is he doing? We're trying to peek in, but it was dark. He had this little silver flashlight, you know, trying to see. Next thing we know, we hear this sliding sound. I mean, this thing's just dragging. We can hear something dragging all the way from the bowels of this cubby hole. And out comes this 19, maybe 50, early, early, early colored TV set. Just a box. And he's dragging this thing out. And he brings it over. And then he grabs this gold aluminum TV stand. Clear plastic wheels that look like they won't hold anything. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? Some people are like, oh, yeah. Pull that thing out, set it at the end of our bed, picks the TV up, sets it on there, reaches in his pocket. He stole, I don't know, maybe he borrowed some tubes they got from work. Back there working on this thing because the Reds are playing tonight. <laughs> and he's replacing tubes in this thing. And then he turns the thing on. Just in the antenna, this fuzzy picture comes in. It was a life changer. The reds, the big red machine, full color, nowhere near high definition. <laughs> I mean, you had to sit right up. And nowadays, you're like, we probably got radiation poisoning. Because you had to sit right up in front of that thing to see the thing, right? The tube is only so big on this, this little box sitting on top of this stand. And night after night, we sat there watching the Cincinnati Reds play and watch them go and win the World Series. All because of a little door that got opened. It changed my life. (laughs) Changed my dad's life. I've never seen him so excited in all my life. My brother and I got to sit there. My mom, we all sat there at the end of our bed watching this old TV. After that, it went back into cubby hole and drug all the way back, to, back in that corner. It's probably still got that thing. But it was an open door. And the empty tomb, with the stone being rolled away, is a significant piece in our lives. 
Because we've all experienced going through an open door. But our Heavenly Father has a much greater door that He wants us to open. I'm just going to look at some scripture here. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the Romans. He wrote, by entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, that is to set us right with him, make us fit for him. We have it all together with God because of our master Jesus. Now this is the whole essence of what he did on the cross for us and what he did by overcoming death. Both sin and death are defeated. That we can enter into this faith to have this life that God has always wanted for us. And he goes on, he said, and that's not all. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown open his door for us. He made a way for us in his death on the cross and overcoming the grave. And he says, we we find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise. We get to live in the fullness of all that God has for us in Christ because he opened a door for us. But what we have to do is we have to respond to it. Right? You can't drive a car unless you get through the open door. Right? You can't get in your house unless you go through the open door. And so we see multiple times in, in Scripture, Jesus in the very last book in the New Testament, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus says these words. It's an invitation to this new life in him. And he said, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. He's inviting us. He longs for us to have fellowship with him. That's what it means to come in and eat, to have fellowship with him, to sit down and have a meal and have fellowship. That's what the Jewish people did often. And he's saying, all you got to do is open the door. Open the door of your heart. And ask him to come in. It's an open invitation. And he will come in and live with us. Going back to the letter to the church in Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 17. It says Christ will live in you. As you open the door and invite him in. He will live in you. Easter, the empty tomb, it's an invitation to this new life in Christ. And Paul goes on, and he said, and I ask him, because Paul was always praying. He said, I'm asking him that, that with both feet planted firmly on love, that you'll be able to take in with all followers of Jesus the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love, the extent that he went through for us, the mock trials, the beating, the suffering that he endured before he even was nailed to a Roman cross. Crying out, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Crying out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And for the first time ever, he experiences it as the Father just briefly turns his face away as he, in that moment, scholars believe, takes the sin of the world upon himself. He becomes the offering for sin for us. And then... Right before he breathes his last, he says, it is finished. That was Friday, but Sunday was coming, right? And Jesus rose from the grave as our kids eloquently displayed for us and shared with us. And we have the hope of eternal life, that the grave is not the end. We have the hope of the resurrected power of Christ that we can have alive in us when we simply open the door. We have this invitation to this new life in Christ. In verse 19, Paul says, reach out and experience the breadth. Test its length, its plumb, its depths. Rise to the heights. Live full lives, full in the fullness of God. That's the essence of Easter. That's the significance of the empty tomb. Jesus wants us to live the fullness of life that is only in him. That's why he came, that we could have the fullness of life, but we have to respond. 
we have to open the door.